Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much to the group for the um, for the invitation. I'm I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, trade agreements, specifically from the uh, perspective of agriculture and food, Canadian agriculture and food, which is uh, the area that I specialize in. Um, and you know, just a little bit of an introduction as far as who Canada is as a trading nation in agriculture and food. Some of the opportunities, irritants, and, and sensitivities that we have in ag and food as it relates to trade. Uh, I am uh, going to talk about Trans-Pacific Partnership. I suspect that uh, some of us may, had, may have had to redo some of our remarks after the announcement on Monday, and, and, and I certainly had to do that, and then, and then uh, conclude with uh, kind of what's next. Okay, who are we? What do we bring to the table uh, in agriculture and food uh, as it relates to agriculture and food? Well, a few things. Uh, first of all, we, we have a tremendous endowment of natural resources that enables agricultural production. Uh, as I'll show you here in a moment, that makes us structurally export-oriented. Uh, in fact, we'd, we'd sort of have to figure out what on earth we would do with Western Canada if we could not export uh, agricultural products and, uh, and or food products. Uh, we also have a diverse agriculture, and I think this is important to, to understand. We, we produce many, many different types of farm products and foods. Most of them are relatively small in scale or, or domestically uh, oriented. So that limits some of uh, our, our interests in trade. We have divergent views on how to market uh, farm products. And, uh, and finally, and, and I think this was made reference to, um, particularly in the food processing area, we worry somewhat about our lagging labor productivity or manufacturing productivity in general in, uh, in food. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an illustration of that. Okay, um, we have a very large uh, arable land endowment, about 173 million acres. 9% uh, of the world's fresh water. It's not always in the places that we would like it to be, but, but it's a tremendous endowment of fresh water. Um, very low density production, our, our livestock production, uh, and if you wanted to contrast it with let's say the UK or something, where it's very compacted in specific areas, ours is, is pretty well spread out, which gives us the advantage of being free of a lot of the types of crop and livestock diseases that other, other countries uh, deal with. Um, I track some of the OECD indicators around um, environmental and natural resource factors in, in agriculture. And just, there's a lot of numbers here, but uh, just, to, just to contrast, Canada with one of our OECD partners, Korea, um, we have roughly, I think it's 42 times the arable land endowment per capita that Korea does. Um, something like 14% of the nitrogen fertilizer application per unit of, uh, of area. About 5% of the pesticide use uh, per unit area compared with, uh, with Korea, and um, the water resources that we draw upon for agricultural production as a proportion of what we can do on a sustainable basis are much, much lower than Korea, as, as well as uh, most other OECD countries. Uh, we're a little bit similar to, to the U.S. And, uh, and Australia in that regard, but uh, it, it gives us a tremendous platform from which to produce farm products. Some farm products, we, we genuinely operate at global scale. And, and what do I mean by that? Um, I, maybe the best definition is that, that we can operate complete supply chains, uh, multiple supply chains in some cases, with full scale, best available technology. Um, those products are uh, canola, largest single producer of canola in the world, wheat, um, pulse crops, so lentils, chickpeas, uh, dry peas, pork, beef. There are a few others. Um, I think I'd say that about greenhouse vegetables, as well as uh, potatoes to some extent. So, so we're global players in, in, uh, in these products. Now, with that acknowledged, we, we, can, we can produce a lot of different things in Canada, uh, but not all at global scale. So. I'll say more about dairy, dairy, poultry, and eggs in a few minutes, but uh, these are industries that have a domestic focus based on past concerns around farm products marketing, and, and we've, uh, we've essentially limited ourselves in that way. Uh, Eastern Canadian grain segments, so corn, uh, soybeans, wheat, that are produced in Ontario and Quebec primarily, looks a lot like the Midwest U.S. system. It's just much, much smaller. 
So attempting to you know, motivate global scale supply chains out of our, our land area in those products is, is difficult for us, especially compared with the Midwestern US. Um, horticulture in Canada, we're somewhat limited by a northern climate. So basically we have horticulture in parts of the country that will permit it based on climate, uh, soil type, uh, rainfall, etc. So we look at southern Ontario, uh, lower mainland of BC, the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia, and, and southern Quebec. Um, we, we have some good uh, processing and some supply chains that can operate off that basis, but, but nothing that you would call global scale, mostly domestically um, uh, focused. Just to give you an example, the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association uh, says that we produce 144 different horticultural commodities in the province of Ontario, but only a very small subset really are at a material scale, and that's essentially limited by our, uh, by our climate. I'll say a little bit about uh, uh, farm products marketing, which is um, domestic policy that we have in Canada. These diverge somewhat, and this divergence, I think, is, has grown over time. We look at um, the products in which we are global scale, in which we end up having an inherent export orientation. Over time, we have um, kind of backed off on protection or uh, regulatory instruments on the marketing side that, uh, that relate to those products. So in the past, we used to have provincial pork marketing boards. With one exception, they're all gone today. We used to have Canadian wheat board. Uh, it no longer exists. We never had those types of things in beef or oil seeds really to begin with, and, and there's no interest in establishing them today. Um, conversely, when we look at dairy, poultry, and eggs, where we have supply management systems, those are built on past issues of chronic surplus, low prices, and some concerns about market power, and, and that's why those institutions uh, exist today. Some of the same things exist in horticultural products, largely fragmented on a, on a province by province basis, um, as well as uh, according to commodities. So, so that's a little bit about who we are. What do we trade? Well, no, no surprise maybe what we trade. Um, in order to clear markets, uh, we absolutely need um, uh, market access on canola, wheat, beef, pork. I've, I've got some illustrations here. Um, when we, when we uh, encompass canola oil, canola meal, and canola seed, 90% of it's exported, 75% of the wheat, 65% of the malt, 60% of the pork, and 50% of the beef when we, when we count live, uh, live hogs as well as uh, live cattle. So our major exports, really pretty much what you would, ex what you would expect. Uh, wheat, canola, pork, pulse crops, um, seafood, soybeans, um, processed uh, cereal crops, baked goods and so on, cattle, beef. What do we import? Well, the kind of things probably that a, that a developed country with a northern climate you'd expect would import. Uh, wine and spirits. Um, uh, branded food mixes, baked goods, uh, coffee, which we can't produce here, sugar, chocolate, uh, tropical products, uh, fruit juices, fresh fruit, etc. How is that performed um, over time? Um, and this is where I think we, uh, we see some uh, issues for concern. So the blue line here, live animals and, and animal products, you can see that on a, a net export basis we're doing in the range of six billion. Um, and pretty uh, relatively steady, I would say. Uh, the red line here, which is called vegetable products, includes field crops. So that has increased um, very significantly over time. Part of that is just straight pricing, of course, commodity price uh, um, cycles. Uh, fats and oils, again, a very major contributor and growing. But the one I would draw attention to is the purple line, which is dominated by processed food products. And while we are surplus, um, uh, trade surplus significantly in baked goods and, uh, and some other bakery products, we have really suffered on the food processing side. In, the, in, um, in, in some areas, we're significantly trade surplus, but our competitiveness, our productivity has suffered in that area. Okay, let me move on to TPP here uh, uh, quickly. So as... Uh, as, as uh, Ludovic uh, mentioned a moment ago, we have a number of existing um, uh, trade agreements negotiated in the last number of years, some real blockbusters with uh, Jordan and, 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 and Peru, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, a few pending, Canada E, the, the CETA agreement, Canada EU is a major trade agreement. Uh, we also did one with Ukraine back in the, um, back in the summer. So I've tried to arrange that next to some of the TPP member countries. So there's 11 other countries in the TPP agreement. Um, and really the, the question is, when you already have trade agreements with a number of these, well, you know, it's really who is new. Who's new for us are uh, New Zealand, Australia, Brunei, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, and Japan. Um, what, is, what is significant uh, for Canada among those countries as an opportunity? Uh, well, there's a number of them that, that I think, frankly, in ag and food at least, are fairly small countries. I, I don't think anyone would get real fired about, up about a trade agreement in ag and food with Brunei as a, as a real blockbuster. Um, what's in it for Canada, I think, first of all, is Japan. Uh, Japan is a highly coveted market for ag and food products. In fact, uh, before it was suspended back, uh, I think, in the spring, we had a bilateral trade negotiation going with Japan. The other one I think that is probably pretty significant here is Singapore, as much as anything as a hub, a trading hub for uh, the rest of uh, Southeast Asia. There's also, going into the TPP um, negotiations, in ag and food in particular, we thought we had a, a few countries that presented threats to us. Uh, New Zealand was seen as a threat because it uh, plays to one of our sensitivities, which is on dairy. And New Zealand pushed hard on dairy because there's actually, I don't think, a whole lot else in the TPP, really, for New Zealand, other than dairy, so they probably had to do that, to a lesser extent, Australia. The other threat came, frankly, from our NAFTA partners, and I think it speaks a little bit to what many have said as um, TPP being something of a defensive interest for Canada, and I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. So key elements in agriculture and food. So the opportunities, uh, the, the ones we would really focus on, it's, it's, it's really Japan on, on the opportunity side. Um, uh, we, we've had um, a great rela relationship with Japan on pork exports, but we have had to reckon with um, very high tariffs and this uh, gate price scheme. So any of you who are familiar with uh, variable import levies that the EU has used in the past. It's somewhat similar to that, although a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's a beef market. It's a great market for wheat and canola oil specifically, and, and I'll talk about that again in a moment. With respect to the U.S. and Mexico, really um, our concern coming into TPP was to be able to retain the North American more or less open market, uh, particularly in red meats. It would have been exceptionally difficult for us to operate in pork and beef markets, in particular if the U.S. had uh, greater access to the Japanese market than we did. Th things would begin to break down. We already have an ongoing dispute with the United States over mandatory country of origin labeling, which is hampering this. We think we're going to bring that to a resolution relatively soon. But, but that's sort of the nature of the defensive uh, interest that we had in ag and food. Our sensitivities, uh, probably everybody is aware of our sensitivities around dairy, poultry, and eggs because of the very high tariffs that support supply management um, schemes. Okay, what do we get? On our opportunity side, um, we got significant um, tariff reductions around this gate price scheme for pork. This is a, a very major win for our pork industry. It's, it's uh, almost maybe a bit of a game changer. Uh, similarly, on beef, we got significant reductions. Uh, we will now have the same access that Australia has. Australia did a, treat, a free trade agreement with Japan last year. So we're going to be in line to have the same access as a key competitor in the Japanese market in beef. That's very important for us. Um, we're going to get additional access on wheat, both feed wheat as well as the TRQ on food-based wheat that uh, increases markedly over with a six-year uh, phase-in. Canola oil is, is a very interesting one. Um, what the Japanese had done, they had a relatively low tariff on canola oil, but it was just enough to cause us to ship canola seed to be crushed basically in ports in Japan. With the removal of this, I believe it'll probably uh, create a lot of investment here to do that canola oil processing here rather than in Japan. So it's, so it's a, on paper, it looks like a very small tariff, but I think it's actually a very large uh, effect. Um, with respect to our NAFTA partners, we did achieve essentially equivalent access 
to the Japanese market and, and other markets in, in red meat. That was very important um, for us. On our sensitivity side, um, we're told that the dairy market access that we have given to other countries is three and a quarter percent of our production. Um, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still looking for the poison pill in this because the industry was prepared for somewhere in the range of five to 15 percent access. And, and how we got that low of access, um, I'm not exactly sure yet, but I think some details are forthcoming. Um, we gave 2.1% on chicken, turkey 2%, eggs 2.3%, and, and hatch, hatching eggs 1.5%. In each case, um, a quota program was announced that would, um, would compensate for losses in the farmer's quota value. And if I understand this correctly, and, and the details are still sketchy, so I stand corrected, there will also be a very significant adjustment program, two and a half billion, that I believe is targeted at the dairy industry and not the others, although that, that may be clarified in the future, as well as a $450 million processing investment program, which again, I think is focused on dairy. Okay, well, what about dairy? In the lead up to the TPP, we had, uh, we had spilt milk on Parliament Hill and, and people uh, protesting, very upset. Um, well, as I just mentioned, um, I, I, I think the dairy industry feels like they've really dodged a bullet here. Only three and a quarter percent. That's, that's really not a lot of uh, increased access to the Canadian uh, dairy market. Um, we need to understand, of course, this is trade policy. Uh, quotas and supply management systems, these are domestic policies. So in principle, they don't really affect one another. Now, what it will end up doing is it will pressure the dairy industry to price more competitively with imports because there will be more imports under TPP. But I, I think to really understand the, the dairy situation on, on balance, um, in a way, TPP was almost a little bit of a distraction because the dairy industry in Canada has very potent challenges that exist regardless of TPP, really. And, and that really comes from increasing imports uh, of dairy products, per particularly uh, milk protein uh, type products from the U.S. that occurs outside of tariff lines. And the challenge we have with milk is it's really a compound product. It's part butter or butter fat and it's part protein or, or non-fat solids. Um, and as we have increasing imports of these non-fat solids that come in from the U.S. with outside of tariff lines, there's really no import controls we can apply to them. It puts the market very badly out of balance. At the same time, the Canadian dairy industry is subject to export caps. So as we have a surge in imports, there's no way to displace that by exporting product. We're subject to caps. So this puts us in a very precarious and difficult uh, position, which, again, really isn't, uh, isn't highly dependent on TPP. So uh, we have negotiations ongoing now between the dairy farmers and dairy processors for renewal of dairy policy that's, that's going to have to engage those, uh, those issues. Um, and, and, and really, that's, that almost operates uh, outside of uh, TPP. OK, so what next? Uh, what, do we, what do we do to really drive this? It's one thing to get the access, but then it's uh, um, something else to capitalize upon the, the access. Well, the first thing we need to do is, is really start thinking about where we're at today in terms of capacity and output relative to the access that we've been granted. Um, I think this is particularly an issue in beef and pork, and I'll just flip ahead here for a second. So, and, and before I do, in CETA, we, were, we, we, uh, we got access of 50,000 uh, 50, tons of beef exports to the EU and 80,000 tons of pork. Uh, in addition, we've got very significant new reductions in tariffs and so on into Japan. Well, this is the trend in our cow herd. Our cow herd is uh, structurally down has not come back up. The pork situation in terms of capacity is um, maybe somewhat better, but not a lot better. So really, right, right now, in terms of the way the market works, the challenge is for processors to scare up enough raw product to be able to run through their plants on a daily basis just to deal with the customers that they have now. So this is a long road. Now, it's a 15-year phase-in on beef, 10-year phase-in on pork. We'll probably need that phase-in to build that capacity. So you know, ultimately, if we're going to do all this business, we need more cattle, more hogs, more plants, more supply chain capacity to be able to wake this, uh, make this whole thing work. There will be other issues. Um, 
product handling standards. There's already been some discussion around how we will handle a low level presence of GM products and so on. That supply chain will have to be dialed in uh, correctly to, uh, to uh, um, take full advantage of this. Uh, we, we've, we have some information now about adjustment assistance for disaffected parties, notably the dairy industry. I, some are going to ask, you know, how disaffected are they really? But uh, three and a quarter percent access and four and a half billion in, in assistance. But uh, we'll, we'll get more information on how that's uh, going to play out. As we get more information, I think it'll become evident how we dial in and refine our domestic policy to really make this work because we always have to remind ourselves it's one thing to get the access in a trade agreement, but we need the private sector investment and the domestic policy that will facilitate it and really make it work. Otherwise, it'll be access that just isn't capitalized on. Thank you.